The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and <laughs> good morning. Welcome to everyone. And uh, this is the INIT webinar, Why Do Miners Need to Integrate Social Performance into Operations? I'm Yelena Gorman. I'm a Principal Consultant at RST Solutions. Uh, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Just very briefly to introduce myself, I've established a consultancy specialising in development of resilient, sustainable and trusted solutions for community engagement. I have 20 years experience working in the mining industry uh, and with the extractive uh, industry broadly across uh, Australia and in internationally. Before I introduce um, our panellists today, I'd like and to start the conversation. There are a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover off. The webinar is being recorded and we'll be emailing a copy of the recording out to all registrants. Uh, so if you need to drop out at any time, don't worry. You'll receive the rest of the conversation in your inbox tomorrow. The session is designed to be interactive. Um, and so we'll be running some polls throughout the conversation that we encourage you to take part in. We welcome any questions you may have. Simply type into your question box um, in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We'd also welcome any comments you may have uh, that contribute to the conversation. If you experience any problems with the sound, we recommend that you exit the webinar and log back in again. So let me move to the panellists. I'm joined today by Nick Pollock, who's the Chief Commercial Officer of K2Fly. Uh, he's, this is a, an ASX listed software company uh, addressing asset intensive sectors of resources and utilities in particular. Nick has 25 years experience in enterprise technologies and K2Fly has allowed him to combine two passions of bringing innovation with software to the resources industry and particularly with sustainability and environment, social and governance solutions to the resources industry. We're also joined by Toby Winkup, who's the managing partner of the Asia Pacific mining sector of uh, environment resources management, the ERM consultancy. Uh, he has a long history of working across the mining sector, more than 20 years within, um, within ERM. He's had particular responsibility as a leader for whole of mining operations, life of cycle, uh, particularly from um, in initial uh, exploration through to closure. And he has worked extensively in Africa and Asia, now based in Western Australia. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Graham Hancock, who's General Manager, Social Performance at Newcrest Mining. He has a background in earth sciences uh, from the University in New Zealand and more recently a PhD in economics. He's worked in, PH, uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Mongolia. He has been a mining specialist for the World Bank and uh, recently joined uh, Newcrest in 2016. So welcome to each of you and thank you so much for bringing your expertise and um, range of knowledge uh, and different perspectives from um, aspects of the industry to our um, conversation today. So let's get into the conversation. I'd like to start with um, understanding a little of, of the key drivers for social license, uh, why it's important across operations, so not just within um, the area called social performance or communities, but rather how it integrates right across a business and have you some good examples that you might focus on? Perhaps I can um, start with you, Graham, uh, so you can talk through some of your exp expertise and, uh, and then move to Toby. Okay, I, well, <clears throat> I guess fundamentally the key driver in the business is that, uh, you know, you require access to land for exploration and development and, uh, and securing continuous operations. It's a, a key value driver in the business at the, at the end of the day. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the purpose that we have um, in the social performance function is fundamentally to build the relationships needed, built on trust and mutual respect, which, uh, which facilitate the conversations and the engagement that go forth, which enables you to achieve, you know, ultimately to achieve some shared outcomes with the communities around you, which I would call shared value. But, uh, you know, the good performance is fundamentally underpinned by the, the ability to develop, I think, written agreements with the communities which, which articulate their aspirations and how ultimately the company will support them to achieve their objectives. 
and and the good good examples I see of that around is now that really there are now many uh, Illuas with Aboriginal communities across Australia, which I actually think are are very good examples of of trying to build that uh, trusting relation trusted relationships and articulating the objectives of the community. And the same thing that we do, you know, we apply the same uh, principles in Newcrest in, in our community development agreements in Papua New Guinea, which we call the memorandum of agreement. And, you know, I guess it's about trying to identify those things which the community values that, um, that you know, that we can support uh, to, to ultimately build resilient communities that, um, you know, that, that can survive without us. So I'll pass it on to Toby. Yes, Toby, if you'd like to just um, draw that out across some of the experiences that you've had more broadly yeah, sure. from a consultant point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And I think importantly, and historically, mining companies have defined their operations and impacts as either inside the gate or, or outside the gate. But I think it's really important that companies recognise that metaphorically speaking, there's no gate. Host communities provide workforce and, and other resources across the, the life of a mine. And the communities are part of the mines and the mines are part of the communities. And as such, those host communities can be your biggest advocate or your, your biggest detractors for a, for a company or, or a project. Um, ARM did some research uh, a little while back now at the height of the last boom where we looked at 160 capital projects globally. 50% had been delayed and, and one of the main reasons behind that delay was a lack of community consent. Um, and I remember at PDAC a few years ago, um, Mark Kudafani, the CEO of Anglo-American said that he was around $25 billion worth of projects that have been stalled globally at that time because of, of community opposition. And, and it's, it's a real challenge for the sector. Um, and I think to Graham's point, I remember last year at, at IMARC, Sandeep, um, the Newcrest CEO, Sandeep Biswan, uh, he talked about the evolution of the Lahir project. And I think it's a great example how there's, there's, there's no gate at a mining community. Uh, he said uh, the, the evolution of the project has been a heap of challenges. Uh, and Graham, you might want to talk to them in a little more detail. But he said it, it took embedding the mine team in the community um, to turn that project around. As soon as that mine team were in there, started to understand what the community concerns was, and that team was seen as part of the community, uh, the performance of the the here project really improved. So I think I think that's a great example of of, of where that, that the the value of sort of getting the, the the host communities engaged and on board and a part of what you're doing is is a driver of real project success. Yeah, absolutely Can agree. Comment on that. Sorry, do you want me to comment? This is Graham here. Just in responding to Toby's comment. Yeah, from from the from the, what what Toby mentioned, it's absolutely correct. Um, it it wasn't until we we integrated the social performance objectives within the entire business uh, environment that we we started to get traction and so that people actually saw that what we did inside the fence was the same as what we did outside the fence and and that it ultimately um, you know that that the community uh, became engaged with us in 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 determining the future of the project and uh, so that, that meant really engaging with them but by engagement I don't mean just talking to them and telling them what you're going to do engaging is when you actually um, work with the community, consult with them, and take their concerns into consideration in your decision making. That's absolutely critical. So, um, Graham, moving from that, one of the areas that we see now rising with activism, but also from a financial point of view, is an expectation of that sort of integration right across an organisation. Uh, that's taken as the norm. Uh, it's also good good practice. Uh, Nick, I was wondering if you might. Um, take us through some of the changes that we've seen in the financial uh, sector in relation to investment with the extractive industry. Yeah, thanks, Janina. Sure. Um, I suppose there's three areas that I'd talk about um, in, in relation to the way finance is looking at this and probably the most traditional uh, factor that most people are already aware of would be the risk perspective that they take on any project, um, you know, in terms of their ongoing liabilities, 
even to a post-closure point uh, with, with regards to their investment. So the fact that you're no longer invested in, in a project doesn't mean that your liability to that project and any damage you may cause uh, 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 are not seen as ongoing. So uh, I think we've, we've been aware of that that view for, for some time. That's, that's I, I guess, what's driving a lot of the early adopters of, uh, of ESG practices in this area would be risk aversion or risk management. Mm -hmm. Um, what's evolving really quickly now, though, is just the increased expectations by stakeholders across the board, and how that's kind of um, coming to the fore is when when the finance, when the funds look at where their their money is coming from, and a lot of that money is coming from, in a global sense, uh, university endowments or or um, big family office endowments, um, and in Australia, that's probably more more relevant. So to say um, the the role that the superannuation funds play in investment. And all of those organisations, wherever they may come from, have a broad church of people driving them with very you know, broad views on climate change or social policy and what have you. So there's, they don't fall into any particular one camp. So those stakeholders that hold the money then drive it through the funds are really interested to see where their money has been invested in. And I suppose you know one of the interesting facts that we're seeing now is that sort of one in four dollars globally is being invested in sustainable and responsible investments. Um, actually, Lucy, if you want to put up slide eight, there's a bit more um, detail on that. So that 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 trend is definitely growing, and that's sort of growing at 38% per annum. So you know, within a few years, we'll probably see more than 50% of money uh, of dollars going into social and, and sustainable investment. Just finally. Um, Another view from a, from a fund perspective is the, the sort of time critical nature in, in terms of the return on my capital. So there's, there's increasingly a trade off between um, the quality of the ore body that I'm looking at and the economics around that. So you know, traditionally it'd be you know, great intersection, great tons, great grade, um, let's go mine it and the economics stack up. Um, that balance has been significantly redressed by ESG factors. So. Um, increasingly the funds and the fund managers are looking at investments in particularly in new projects in and around the ESG factors first um, almost and, and that that balance is really coming into play whereas whereas you might have a ter ter terrific ore body which uh, where the economics are fantastic but if you can't gain that social license to operate or even the license to operate in a timely fashion well I actually might go over here where there's a lesser grade but I've got more chance of my funds being utilised and getting that uh, project into an operating mine. Mm -hmm. So they're the three things that sort of I'm seeing most of all in, in my studies. Thanks for that. I think that's very useful. We've also got a couple of other slides that uh, people would be familiar with, I imagine. Uh, the EY slide and uh, one recent one from Deloitte's, which looks at the aspects of risk uh, across the industry. Uh, and perhaps that um, plays into this second question, um, because in effect, uh, social licence issues are something that uh, most uh, mining operations are now confronting. Uh, surely, rather than seeing it as a competitive advantage to be a better um, provider of social engagement, it should be seen more as a norm. Uh, and I'm wondering why we see variations in the level of social performance, because coming back to Nick's comment, uh, investors are expecting performance to be uh, considered across the board uniformly. It's not just a case of because you're a large operation, you do better. Um, smaller operations have that responsibility. So, um, Toby, I'd be interested to get your perspective from across the industry in terms of performance standards and roles that you see as you're going in to assist uh, companies in their early days of uh, decision making around the market. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think I think it's important to reflect on on what Nick said around sort of the imperatives of, of the availability of funds, um, <clears throat> and this idea of it's it's a competitive advantage. But I don't think it is a competitive advantage anymore. It's it's absolutely a business imperative. Um, so when you get sort of Larry Fink, the CEO of, of BlackRock, coming out and saying, look social license to operate and is key to prosperity and sustainability of companies you get your you get your your various press around projects being stalled 
the impacts of rebel stakeholder groups is a really interesting rise in in the mining sector over the last couple of years and and the agendas that they're driving um, is absolutely a business imperative for, for companies um, to get this sorted out and, and have it as business as usual and I think where we see the difference um, is when at the executive level in a company, there is a representative from sustainability um, at the board level, and and they recognise and see the, the the financial imperative of of what it means to around all of the factors of ESG, environment, social, and governance to to clearly articulate at the board level the impact to the organisation. So I think that's where we. Um, see the real difference in how this is rolled out globally um, across different companies. If, if there's representation at the board level, because what we're seeing is 10 years ago, social and sustainability generally were very much the the, the technical sciencey types in an organisation um, who really struggled to find a voice. Um, mm -hmm. I think post last boom and some of the challenges that the, the sector is seeing with regards to the performance in the sector, the brand of the sector in particular, um, where we do see that that engagement at the board level, that's where, where companies are really making a difference. Does that answer your, your question there, Yanina? Absolutely, thanks uh, for that. And Graham, perhaps you can um, give us a practitioner perspective on that uh, from your experiences in the industry. Well, I, I would actually see that at the moment, um, you know, good performance good performance does constitute a competitive advantage um, in terms of, um, you know, securing your, your investors and, and interests of your investors. Um, mm -hmm. But, and, and I think there's a growing maturity in this space, you know, in the past cash strap juniors would get out there and do exploration and, you know, it was the geologist's job to engage with the community. I think we're seeing that progressively changing, although perhaps not fast enough, you know, the majors, uh, clearly now have uh, social performance professionals embedded in in uh, in exploration teams, which is is what Newcrest is now doing, um, and and I think you know that's come from from the fact that there's there's a growing realization out there that uh, during the exploration phase, you know, a, it has the potential to accrue a lot of value to the business, but that's contingent on having your community relations in place, and um, you know. If you might discover a great ore body, but if you don't have a secure land access or a license to operate, it's of little value to you. And one of the things that we've been, uh, you know, looking at in our business development activities in Newcrest, you know, there's lots of great ore bodies out there, of which uh, which are in fact in effect are sterilised by toxic community relationships, and so they're, they're valueless. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're seeing a growing maturity in that in the area, and um, you know it should be business, it should be the norm, it should be business as usual. But at the moment, I still think that we've got some way to go, and and particularly in the junior sector. Graham, but just on just on that, Graham, there's a we see a lot of the mids and majors um, farming in to to juniors to exploration companies um, in in jurisdictions where perhaps they they are a little more risk averse um, around wanting to to invest wholly but I think the real challenge there is is ensuring that where they do farm in through seed funding in in some of these exploration companies that to your point is ensuring that if the resources do prove up the the behaviors and the activities of, of those exploration um, companies and teams don't impact uh, the viability of that resource um, as, it, as it shores up technically and the, the non-technical risk make it non-viable. Well, it's clearly a part of our due diligence process in the business. Is if, you know, it, the, the social dimensions of due diligence are front and centre in in our process within the business. And and I think it's it's, uh, you know, it's, there's a growing recognition that this is incredibly important to future value. So at this stage, we've got an opportunity to uh, put together a bit of a poll, um, and I think that question that's been uh, posed really uh, gives us an opportunity to consider how the mining and resources sector compares with other industries when it comes to social performance. Uh, so we have a choice of four. 
uh, if people on the line would like to um, make a decision and answer, A, is the mining and resources sector is leading the charge, B, about the same, C, we're well behind other industries, and D, I don't know. So if you've got some views about um, the, the current status uh, in terms of uh, performance in this area, please do uh, fill in the poll. Uh, we also um, have a number of opportunities for you as uh, people online to provide some questions, some of which we've utilised uh, to help put together this conversation. But if you have some other questions, please do use the uh, tab to uh, participate. Uh, so perhaps if we could go to uh, some of the issues we've seen in social performance across the industry, both from an investment point of view and also um, commenting on the potential challenges as companies rush in to get access and then provide some challenges down the track for uh, the development of a site. Um, looking at some of the slides uh, on conflict uh, that came out of the study done some years ago by um, Daniel Franks and um, Rachel Davis uh, on conflict, we can see that there are some challenges ahead. Uh, I'm just interested from your perspective, Graeme, if you could talk about uh, how we manage across the life cycle of community engagement, um, particularly at the closure stage, but also when you look through some of the slides uh, on issues in dispute, quite often we find that there's, um, particularly this, this, uh, this next slide um, looks at the time frames. So Lucy, if we could go to the next slide, uh, when it is that we actually see some real challenges occurring within the life cycle of a mine. Uh, and how that's addressed um, from a you know, direct practitioner point of view. Yeah, well, obviously the, the consequences of getting it wrong um, can be catastrophic, as we've seen in the past. Um, you know, an example like um, Bougainville Copper ultimately led to a, to a serious conflict. Um, but, you know, and, and not all that bad, obviously, but you know, fundamentally, this is, if you get it wrong, it's about loss of business value. And each of the stages have their own unique challenges. And I think that, um, as you can see, that the suspension of projects at an exploration phase in the past, I think, has been uh, pretty significant. Um, and, uh, and I think people are now beginning to address that by, by you know, taking the, the community relations aspects of, of exploration far more seriously. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's about the quality of engagement that you can achieve in terms of your pre-feasibility and, and, and feasibility and construction. If, if, you, if communities are not engaged in the process of decision making uh, and they see impacts which, were, which they didn't uh, didn't um, understand we're going to come their way, then obviously they get pretty upset about it. So I think it's about the quality, still about the quality of engagement and the quality of information sharing and the ability of a company to take their concerns on board and actually act on them to make sure that you get a, an outcome that they understand uh, or, or and, are, and are satisfied with. I think the, the areas around closure um, is, uh, is, a growing area of, of practice uh, for, for us in the business. And, and that's, um, you know, we're now building social closure plans, for example, for, for sites. And, um, you know, dealing with communities as you head towards closure ultimately depends on the quality of what you do during operations. And the main thing I think we, we are now focusing on is that when you're engaged with communities around what we will call shared value projects and, and projects and programs which add value to the community, which are consistent with our own company corporate values, then you know you have to have the end in mind when you when you engage in these things. Creating unsustainable uh, infrastructure or services environment that um, that ultimately will collapse on closure is a is a classical way to to generate conflict. And so you know basically having an exit strategy in mind as you develop your, your social investment programs within communities is absolutely critical to achieving a, a sustainable outcome. So um, that's, that's sort of my, my view of it. Thanks. And uh, Nick, I think um, certainly from an investor point of view, this would be something that would be seen as, uh, as crucial when you look at the uh, impacts of potential conflict on uh, investors 
um, decision making or the, their dollars, uh, this obviously is something that uh, needs to be addressed in our consideration of how to engage with communities more effectively. Yeah, totally, Jane. Um, I mean, just picking up on Toby's point earlier on about sort of transparency and a, and a, and a phrase that I really like is this notion of radical transparency um, and shareholder activism in relation to shareholder activism. And, and again, it's not a, a single group. I mean, many older generational investors um, know how to use Facebook and they get very active on social media as does everyone, but it's not limited to a specific group. So those those actors across the board are becoming much more important and of course um, the 24-hour news cycle is bringing this to us regularly as well. Um, so I mean just to put some facts and figures behind that in the 2018 reporting season the, there was a record number of sustainability related shareholder proposals. Now um, it submitted to ASX 200 companies. Now in total that's 17 which doesn't sound very much but there's definitely a very increasingly sort of increasing trend if you like uh, in and around those proposals being brought to to the uh, AGMs and what have you by shareholders across the board not just sort of um, the single shareholders but their um, the, the superannuation funds are, are more increasingly getting involved and actually co-filing co resolutions uh, to the AGMs and as well the other important player in this group are the proxy advisors who uh, who represent multiple investors so there's no doubt that um, you know, as a, as a, particularly as a publicly listed company, if you if you make these errors, uh, those those there will be consequences from your shareholders. Mm. And uh, Toby, from the point of view of um, sort of the broad aspects of uh, engagement, how do you see this unfolding um, from an industry point of view? Uh, firstly, and also how does how do companies then recover? Uh, when they've been going through conflict because I think there's many different strategies but um, the challenges once having been identified how do we what what experiences have you had or seen that have worked that have recovered a community relation yeah it's it's a, it's a good good question a good challenge I think it, it comes back and I, it sounds like an oversimplification but it's not um, and it comes back to trust if you have the trust of your host community, if they see procedural fairness mm -hmm. in um, how you are engaging with them and, and they have a voice and an influence in outcomes, then you're able, you're given a degree of, in, in my experience, you are then given a degree of leeway um, if something should go wrong, if you respond to it in the right way. So mining projects, generally very long, nothing always goes as planned. There's always gonna be something um, that happens. And that can, if you have that bank of trust and you respond to an incident well, and you generally can get through it. If you, if you don't have that trust and something goes wrong, which invariably will, that's where it's often used as a, an opportunity to to sort of voice greater issues uh, or greater displeasure and abrupt or disrupt um, operations, if, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, I think going to the trust area, it's sort of how do you actually go about measuring trust? I mean, that's um, on a on a process of engagement with your stakeholders and your communities. Um, mm. You know, we've had a whole range of uh, technologies or very simple technologies, perhaps, you know, someone sent out in the old days and said, things are all right out there, we'll be fine. That was the outside, the gate approach. These days, I think we're in a much more sophisticated environment. And looking at this slide on issues in dispute, the importance around benefits, transparency, absolutely, procedural fairness, uh, but the communication and the engagement on a regular basis is really key. I'm interested to get um, your perspectives, uh, perhaps Graham and then uh, Nick, on what what's actually working uh, and how do you deal with um, the real issue that's uh, unfolding, such as a tailings uh, dam concern. Uh, nothing, so hopefully nothing uh, disastrous, but nonetheless, um, something's occurred. You've got some issues around pollution. You've got some uh, change in the practice of the business. How do you actually manage this with an effective communication? Well, again, um, you know, Toby was absolutely correct. If you don't have the trust, you you you, and are hiding to nothing. Um, I think that um, 
you know, it's it's fundamental that that uh, you know that you are constantly working on these relationships. You know, there's no way you can build a relationship in a crisis. That just doesn't work. And so you can't wait for a problem to come your way to get out there and start um, engaging with your community. Um, mm. So you know, it, it's 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 all about having and building and maintaining relationships over a long period of time, and and that requires sustained effort. But uh, yeah, the most important thing when when you when you find yourself in a in a crisis situation is to actually be transparent and to get out there, engage with the community as quickly as possible about what has occurred, and then then and bring them into uh, to talk about well what what is going to be done about it and how it's going to be done and what contribution, if any, that the community uh, can make to that process. Um, if if they feel uh, that they are uh, spectators to what's going on, then uh, I think you just rapidly erode that level of trust um, and and lose it. So it's fundamentally about the quality of engagement, um, and uh, you know that that is your you know, ultimately your safeguard against uh, against closure or disruption in the event of something going wrong. So these days we're moving into a more sophisticated um, stakeholder mapping and data. Um, Nick, have you got some experiences that we can draw on from, from the software work that you've been doing? Um, yes, I think, yeah, I mean, I would absolutely um, agree with, with Graham. You, you can't build trust in a crisis. So, um, you know, from a technologist perspective, um, you know, software or technology is not necessarily going to solve those relationships. It definitely helps in and around transparency and delivering uh, information. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's sort of a, in this instance, it's a facts versus emotion argument to a certain extent. And I think it's probably safe to say that the industry historically has been a bit guilty of over-facting uh, responses and these are things probably because of the engineering uh, fundamentals of, of the business and the, and the people that operate within the business. Um, so facts are, facts are obviously incredibly important, but then uh, organisations need to create a narrative that engages people uh, on that story and that journey and why it's important to them rather than just throwing out facts. And I suppose, again, bringing it back to um, the, the question around technologies, I, I think there's some really interesting things coming out now. Um, so, you know, one of the things we would do would be mapping um, you know, stakeholder heat maps in, in various uh, areas, uh, you know, based on all of the stakeholders that you're, you're engaged with. And, and traditionally that might have been done very much in a spreadsheet orientated way, which is not very scalable or, or transferable. So the technology is getting a lot better now, but to be able to bring that sort of data in, in, a, in a mobile sense and then to output it to back to the community or, or even back to the uh, board or, or executive level. Seeing some really interesting stuff coming out of the CSIRO nowadays, you know, um, not limited to, but they're sort of measuring social media activity on, on as it pertains to certain projects and being able to map that as well in, you know, in an almost real time sense, which is, which is fascinating in terms of, again, the shortening of the cycle of the turnaround of news and information in today's very connected world. So Toby, can I bring you into that conversation because I think um, your experiences uh, would take you right across the potential areas of conflict and while stakeholder mapping is one tool that you can use, um, the face-to-face -face engagement, the, the building of trust, you know, how, how do we manage those given the both the, the, the life cycle of news, one, and two, the expectations of having some sort of data sets to be managing um, this engagement process? Yeah, that's um, that's not <laughs> not the easiest of questions, and I, and I guess it's 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 complicated in the fact that how do you balance the need for return on investment with regards to the realities of the time it takes to to build trust? Um, I reflect on a project I did a number of years ago now. Um, at the very earliest stage um, of the project exploration, pre-exploration, it was it was 18 months of um, investment before we even got boots on ground with the rig, just building that um, 
trust and, and working with the local communities to help them understand the implications of what was proposed. Um, and, and I think that's that's the challenge more broadly. And I think, unfortunately, the, the mining sector has got a brand issue at the moment, um, which makes um, that engagement difficult at times. So you are coming from a, a perspective of mistrust already a lot of the times, um, which can cre create um, those challenges. But I think, Nick, I think I really like your, your, your concept of radical transparency. That's the only way that a lot of the times you, you are going to be able to, to build that trust. Um, and, and it, sometimes it might be through presenting and sharing data. I mean, I look at, at Anglo-American, for example, um, released their socioeconomic assessment tool to the public uh, as a means of, of lifting or trying to lift the performance of the sector more broadly. And, and that was quite unique at the time uh, for a mining company, because um, mining companies do historically have, have um, sort of a history of, of not working together when you compare to other other sectors like the, the oil and gas sector, for example. But we are seeing more of that now, um, much of it sort of on the back of, of recent um, tragedies around tailings where we've seen the mining sectors come together to sort of um, change that brand. So, so you know, I'm not sure if that specifically answers your question, but um, just sort of provide some context around some of the challenges the sector has had beyond an asset level um, with regards to that sort of engagement and, and it's build, building that trust. I think the, the brand comment uh, and building trust, I'll just reflect on the poll here when we went through how do you think um, mining and resources sector compares with other industries uh, and uh, Toby your comments and I think um, you know, certainly challenge more broadly in the industry is how do communities view the mining and extractive industries and in terms of social performance, the poll results from our um, participants, 50 people, 50% of the participants have voted. We're leading the charge, we're about the same, um, and others are making comment that they don't know. And I think um, often when you're in the midst of the industry, you might not necessarily appreciate some of the negative responses, or you're already focused on what uh, opportunities you can provide. But it, it certainly does present us with um, consideration as to how we utilise um, this type of uh, area of social license to perhaps as the radical transparency, the radical engagement, more communication, releasing the kind of documentation that Anglo's undertaken so people can start to build that trust around the industry. Um, one of the questions we have online uh, would the panel share their thoughts on reconciling radical transparency with continuous disclosure obligations? Um, Graham, would you like to, to tackle that one? Yeah, this this is a challenging space because um, you know it ultimately comes down to materiality, um, and um, and I guess um, some risk aversion within within uh, executives to have everything out there. But it is something that I think internally groups like ours. Uh, are working to to encourage greater transparency within the business, but that's that's an ongoing ongoing challenge um, to make sure that uh, you know we, we get things out there. But uh, you know clearly when it when there is uh, any issue that relates to uh, a threat to the community as a result of our operations, then that does happen very rapidly. Um, and you know as as we had when when we had uh, for example the uh, the, the tailings dam um, at Cadia, problems with the tailings dam there, the community were immediately notified and so was the market. So, you know, it is, it is about materiality and it's about, um, you know, continuous disclosure, making sure that you, you meet your obligations to, to, the, to the market, but at the same time, um, you know, ensuring that what you do say to your community is not, uh, not outside the realms of, uh, of, of well, remains consistent with your continuous disclosure obligations. I think it's a great, not uh, great easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Uh, look, perhaps at this stage, we're not far from um, getting to the uh, conclusion. 
Um, perhaps I invite each of you to just briefly uh, mention uh, your engagement at IMARC. Obviously, we're having uh, the event in Melbourne uh, on the 29th and 31st of October, where there'll be more than 7,000 leaders, innovators and key players in the global mining industry. So plenty of opportunity for discussion on mining and social performance. Um, perhaps um, Nick and uh, we might start and then follow with Toby and Graham. Just briefly mention your involvement uh, in the um, conference. Yeah, actually, what I'll, what I'll quickly, you know, you know, I just want to want to comment on that last question. If you, if uh, Lucy could put up slide five in terms of transparency, is an interesting um, graph on there, which uh, talks about which shows some research that we conducted, which compares uh, sort of sustainability reporting in mining organisations. It compares the ICMM membership, which is roughly 27%, uh, 27 member companies, all of whom, not surprisingly, do sustainability reporting. But then the grey area on that um, graph shows the growth in sustainability reporting within Australian mining companies. So that's looking at the sort of top 50 Australian mining companies. And um, I think it's essentially 25, roughly 50% of those mining companies are doing sustainability reporting now. Um, of course, it's, it's, that's, that's not uh, enforced, that, that's their, their own um, initiative that they're taking there. But it sort of does indicate a bit that size does count. So it's kind of the 25 highest capitalised mining companies in Australia. So there's, there's some relationship there, clearly. Um, so I just sort of point that out if, if people are interested in that. Um, we are definitely uh, attending uh, IMARC and looking forward to that. We're on stand J9. Um, I think uh, Lucy is also putting up the paper that we released not long ago on coal climate and the big global trends, which is including uh, radical transparency and what have you incorporated in that. Um, what I, uh, for those that are obviously interested in this topic that are on the, on the um, call today, uh, we, IMARC is conducting a, a full day social licence to operate workshop, which we'll be coordinating. Um, we've got some really exciting speakers coming along to that. Um, we've, for instance, we've secured uh, Martin Fay, who's the, um, the head of ASFA, the, the superannuation funds, and represent, representing all the superannuation funds in Australia. And he'll be talking about the super industry's view of mining and investment and where that's headed, amongst many other things. We're, we're also getting um, uh, some talks on um, the Modern Slavery Act and a whole bunch of case studies as well. So pretty excited about that. So please uh, feel free to contact IMAC and IMARC and join up for that. Thanks very much, that, Nick. Um, Toby, your um, engagement while we're at IMARC? Yeah, so we are sustainability, ERM sustainability sponsor again for IMARC this year. This will be the second year we've done that. Um, we will be having two presentations. So uh, Louise Pierce, our mining sector lead, will be holding a, a plenary um, panel um, with some of uh, the sector's CEOs around social performance, so it won't be dissimilar to this. And then I am presenting again on our position with regards to sustainable mining, um, the mine we want to see. And the, the, the title of, um, it's more of a reflection actually. So the title of my presentation will be Mining at the Tipping Point, a reflection on the last 12 months and the sector's performance against society's evolving expectations. And the reason I want to do this is there were some, some pretty big statements last year at IMARC from a number of the CEOs around sustainability, community and the imperatives around it. And I just want to reflect on that and, and see, see what material change might have happened in the sector uh, in the last 12 months. That'd be very interesting. Thanks. Graham, your involvement? Yeah, and obviously uh, Newcrest is also a sponsor and uh, we have a number of different um, people involved in the in the conference. My, my own uh, particular area, I'll be giving a presentation around uh, you know how do we achieve shared value as a as a as a business and what are the i guess the preconditions necessary uh, to achieve shared value in a in, with, with a, in a mining project with a with a local community so that's uh, my what i'll be discussing most interesting well thank you all very much for that um so we're offering everyone who's attended the webinar uh, a 15 percent discount on their registration so please feel free to sign up and you use the uh, online code slow web s-l-o-w-e-b i think that's up there on the screen uh, if you'd like to revisit this discussion there'll be a recording on mining beacon which is the official content site of imark 
And we'll also email all registrants the uh, link once the recording is ready. So please keep a look out in your inbox. I, Mark, will be holding more webinars between now and October to give you a taste of some of the conversations. Uh, so please head over to theminingbeacon.com to see what's coming up next. And our next webinar will be looking at how the mining industry can unlock the hidden value of tech innovation and startup sector. Finally, there'll be a, a short uh, survey which will appear on your screen. Please do let us know what you thought of the conversation and what conversations you'd like to hear about in the future. It's been a real pleasure um, having uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, social license and, and, and performance, uh, and community's performance um, in light of the uh, various capabilities and expertise of the, the panel. And I really appreciate uh, your frankness on a couple of the, the more challenging points. So thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you to the um, parties that have dialed in and others who have the opportunity to listen. And I look forward to seeing you at IMARC in Melbourne in October. Thanks very much.